calling you out. Come on, face me. Come on, face me, man. You face me. You face me right now, you son of a bitch. What was Alexander Pope? In short, Alexander Pope was a wit, but at length, he was an author. And in a few words, he was the most divisive celebrity of his age. He was also a tiny little baby. Before APs rise to fame, the English language already had a lineage of great poets. But for all of these early writers, that distinction was one of many. The names we remember really could only treat poetry as a side thing, devoting most of their energy to other occupations, often in politics, which made use of their literacy at a time when that was rare. By the 1700s, it was a good time to be into words. About half of the English population was able to read, and coinciding with events like the inception of the novel, and also the creation of the English Poet Laureate's office, it was obvious that reading was going to be a thing going forward. And in the early 18th century, Alexander Pope became one of the first English authors to make their living solely as a poet selling his works through bookstores without attachment to the royal court or sponsorship by people who looked like this. He wrote poetry and people bought it. But despite Pope's success marking a turning point in the history of letters, most of his works aren't read in full or really promoted much at all today. Part of the reason for this is because his efforts were all in satire, frequently lampooning the social climate and art culture of the 18th century. While inventive, what that means is that unless you're already familiar with the literary world of the 17th, these names and narratives won't do much for today's reader. Even though Pope's plots might have suffered over the centuries, a lot of his lines are still popular in English speech today, whether you're aware of it or not. Hey, is human. What's more interesting than Alexander Pope's legacy today was his reputation in life. Pope's career can be summarized by the great maxim, talk shit, get hit. Like I've said, his satires targeted everybody, and predictably many of the victims retaliated, which Pope usually rejoined with more mean words. This facet of Pope's activity can make evaluation of his character difficult. Was this a Chris Chan style obsession with beating the detractors? Or was Pope just prodding his enemies for more material? Was he keck or was he cringe? It's tough to say with somebody so proud and weird. To me, it's obvious that Pope liked the dynamic of adding a villain to the right world. In the essay on criticism, he mentions a certain Mavius, who Wikipedia says was a foil to Horace and Virgil in the Roman Age of Augustus. The seething verses both poets dedicated to him speak for themselves, but they also spoke to Pope, who would immortalize his own enemies in verse in true classical fashion. But even though there's some homage happening, many of Pope's more famous feuds were obviously personal. One of Pope's early wars was waged against the veteran poet Richard Blackmore, an author who came to prominence towards the end of the 1600s, when he began writing his own epic poetry, drawing heavily from the classics, and sucking off the winners of England's latest civil war. Of course, this boosted Blackmore's career, and before long he was attached to the court. It was obvious to many what Blackmore hoped to gain from his epics. Glory hole John Dryden, the first poet laureate, loathed and ridiculed Blackmore's style before Alexander Pope had even published. But Blackmore's gaffes will be best understood through an example. Take a look at this sample from Blackmore and this sample from Pope. At first glance, it's easier to point out the similarities than the differences. Both passages use allusion to the classics, and both are written in couplets. Pope and many others wrote almost exclusively in heroic couplets during the first half of the 1700s, for better or for worse. But even if these passages both read sort of wooden for similar reasons, the two authors are making very different uses of the meter upon further inspection. For Blackmore, the verses, and really, poetry as a whole, or largely a means to an end. A way to jerk off his friends and garner power. The lines don't speak, they moan. In Pope's case, I think of his plots foremost as vehicles for good verse. Line for line, he was one of the hardest writers of his age, employing the quick setup and release of the couplet to make bars. All of the Pope quotables that still get repeated today work for that same reason. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Short, sweet, and to the point. Eternal sunshine of the spot 
thoughtless mind, each prayer accepted and each wish resigned. And a personal favorite from the essay on criticism, in poets is true genius is but rare, true taste is seldom is the critic share. Artistic differences were enough to soil poor Richard for Pope, but he also made himself an easy target after publishing the satire against wits in 1700. This was Blackmore's manifesto where he railed against the trend of vulgar and irreverent satirists appearing in his day, which he called the wits, the type Pope would exemplify in a few short years. Pope and his friends assaulted Blackmore across many works until and after his death in 1729. The most memorable affront came as the essay Perry Bathos, in which a certain Martin Scriblerus invents a new word for anticlimax, and names Richard Blackmore as its synonym and progenitor. Inclusions like this are the highlight of Pope's war with Blackmore, but beneath the jabs, the conflict between the two is pretty philosophical. The contempt Pope held for Edmund Curl is a lot more straightforward. According to legend, Edmund Curl was a bookseller in the grimy streets of London. If you Google him today, there aren't a ton of unique sources about Curl, but this print where he's seen running a workshop of devils probably speaks to his reputation. In an age where publishing, copyright, and distribution were basically untested, most authors opted to have their works both printed and sold exclusively by individual bookstores. Edmund Curl published countless low-quality works of his own, but also sold homebrew versions of other bookstores' bestsellers, including those from our own Mr. Popo. This obviously troubled the poet, but things were made worse after Curl published a number of Pope's private letters, and eventually boiled over when a few lines falsely attributed to Pope appeared as the preface to the Curl published court poems in 1716. An infuriated Pope was finally ready to take his revenge as close friend Jonathan Swift records. Now on the Wednesday ensuing. Mr. Lintert, a neighboring bookseller desired a conference with Mr. Curl about setting a title page, inviting him at the same time to take a wet together. Mr. Pope found means to convey himself into the same room under pretense of business with Mr. Lintert, who it seems is the printer of his Homer. This gentleman with a seeming coolness reprimanded Mr. Curl for wrongfully ascribing to him the aforesaid poems. He excused himself by declaring that one of Curl's authors wrote the preface. Upon this, Mr. Pope, being to all appearance reconciled, very civilly drank a glass of mead to Mr. Curl, which he has civilly pledged, and, though the liquor in color and taste differed not from common sack, it was plain by the pangs this unhappy stationer felt soon after, that some poisonous drug had been secretly infused therein. Curl went home, where his wife observing his color change said, Are you not sick my dear? He replied, Bloody sick. And fell vomiting and straining, the contents of his vomit being green as grass. After Curl's recovery from this episode, antagonism between him and Pope continued, and the latter continued to make more enemies in the business. As mentioned by Swift, Alexander Pope had great success writing his own editions of Homer, predictably re-rendered in heroic couplets. He would try following up this success with his own versions of Shakespeare some years later. Unfortunately, the creative liberties taken by Pope to make the text fit his style were not appreciated by critics. One Louis Theobald, a flagging actor and Shakespearean scholar, would redress Pope's errors in the snidely titled Shakespeare Restored, or a specimen of the many errors as well committed as unamended by Mr. Pope in his latest edition of this poet, designed not only to correct said edition, but to restore a true reading of Shakespeare to all the editions ever published. Theobald's reckoning was a complete embarrassment for Pope, and in order to repair himself and defend off from the hundred other writers he was battling, Pope's next satire was to be his opus. In 1728, the first edition of the Dunciad debuted, a satire of Virgil's Aeneid. This satire allowed Pope to ridicule every villain of the art at length. Richard Blackmore's beating was so bad it fucking killed him. Edmund Curl toiled to expose the veiled parodies, and Louis Theobald took center stage as the Prince of dullness, taking the brunt of Pope's attacks. Filling out the plot with Namby Pamby Ambrose Phillips, Thomas Osborne, and others, the Dunciad was a seismic, salty masterpiece. Over the next 15 years, a series of updates were made to the text. Before Pope rewrote Theobald's star role for Kali Sibber, Kali had a minute role in earlier editions of the satire, but over time came to excite Pope's wrath during his long tenure as Poet Laureate. This final update to the Dunciad was released in 1743, less 
than a year before Alexander Pope's death, where he took most of his feuds to his grave. And after his enemies met the same fate, most interest in Augustan poetry went with them. It's a shame, really. Alexander Pope's probably one of my favorite of history's mad lads. I'm genuinely impressed by his ability to be so based and so cringe. So what was Alexander Pope? Well, I guess he was Keck, but he's still really short.